Hi, I'm Bill O'Donnell, and welcome to another program on spirituality. Uh, I'm indeed thrilled to have as my guest today Father Simeon Gallagher, Franciscan Capuchin from St. Louis, Missouri, who I met several years ago at St. Francis Cathedral when he gave a uh, church retreat there, and I thought it was fabulous, and there wasn't time to bring him in now, but uh, by the grace of God, he's back in Santa Fe uh, as we speak, uh, giving a retreat at Santa Maria de la Paz on the spirituality of relationships. And I've got to attend half of it. We're at the halfway mark, but by the time this airs, he'll already be gone. But anyhow, thank you, Father, for coming. Welcome. Well, great to have you here. Uh, tell the folks at home a little bit about who you are. For those who don't understand why you're wearing this, this, this girly gown that you got on your father. Um, I'm a, a Capuchin Franciscan, which means that I follow the rule that St. Francis of Assisi wrote in the 12th century. There are many branches of the Franciscans, and I belong to the Capuchins. They were a 15th century reform on the Franciscans. Uh, many of the orders that were begun in the 10th, 11th, and 12th century by the time of the Reformation had lost their steam and needed to be revitalized and renewed, and the Capuchins were um, the revitalizing and renewing group on the Franciscans. Uh, we got our name from this large capuche that hangs down my back. And um, we are involved in all kinds of different ministries, although primarily with the poor and also in preaching, which is what I do. Um, there are about 12,000 of us in the world, a very heavy commitment to third world situations. Uh, friars from my own province, for example, are working among Stone Age people in Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a, an extensive commitment to the church and to the world, and um, I'm just one of them. Uh -huh. I, I, I got away with teasing you because uh, I know that uh, this is Franciscan country, as you know, and you mentioned today the story that the brown came from the Italians, and that's where cappuccino came that's from, correct. from the color. Is that true? Well, I, it story. is. I mean, uh, <laughs> The Italians have such a wonderful way with words, uh -huh. and the coffee cappuccino right. was not founded or started by us, but our habits are the same color as the coffee beans, yeah. so they named the coffee after us, and uh -huh. the Capuchins, in their reforming of the Franciscan order, eliminated anything that smacked of pretension, mm. and men who shaved in the 15th century were considered pretentious because mm. of the soaps and the colognes and so forth. So all the early Capuchins grew beards. Yeah. And as these men got older, their beards turned gray. And that's why they added the swap of whipped cream to the top of the cappuccino. Now, I know that a lot of people don't think that that's accurate. But if you tap into any gourmet dictionary or a website on the origins of um, of gourmet food, I, I think you'll find that to be relatively accurate. Okay, I'll accept it at face value. And <laughs> relatively next get, accurate. Next time I get a chance, I'll, I'll have a cappuccino and think of you. But the reason I bring it up is because I understand that the, I mean, this was pioneered, this part of the world, the Southwest, was pioneered by the Spanish Franciscans. That's correct. Um, and I believe they wore denim colored coming in for some reason. Now, everybody here that I see, except for uh, during Fiesta, when they recreate what was here, they're all wearing brown. So mm -hmm. it's now become the, the dominant color for Well, Francis if you go to Assisi, there is the remnants of one of Francis's own habits. This is what we call this because we, re we wear this regularly. So yeah. it's kind of an habitual garment. Mm -hmm. So we call it a habit. And if you go to Assisi, there is a remnants of one of the habits that he himself wore. And it, it, it's more gray blue than brown. Mm -hmm. I don't know at what point um, it became brown, okay. but um, there's a famous joke that they tell, you know, that uh, f uh, someone commissioned an artist to come up with um, a picture of Francis, a painting of Francis, and the Capuchin said he has to be in our habit, and the Third Order Regator said uh, that's another branch of the Franciscans. They said, uh, no, that he has to be in our habit, and on and on and on. So what the artist did, he put Francis on his deathbed with the covers pulled up to his neck <laughs> and just eliminated the whole problem. Okay. Well, thank God for Francis and the inspiration that he was for the church and for all of us here. And uh, particularly just recently, um, the Archdiocese of Santa Fe celebrated their 150th anniversary as a diocese. 
but as the Archbishop Sheehan correctly stated, uh, we, we're indebted to the Span Spanish Franciscans who brought the faith in here over 400 right. years ago, and it's been here ever since. And, and uh, as the Holy Father said as he flew over Santa Fe on his way to Phoenix years ago, he, he told us that this was the cradle of Christianity in the New World. It's true. I think thankful. that I, I know that Archbishop Sheehan um, is very much in touch with uh, Franciscan history, and uh, I often have to chuckle because I watch the proceedings of the bishops when they gather in November, and some of the East Coast prelates will often uh, emphasize how old their dioceses are and how established they are. And I know that Archbishop Sheen is probably sitting there smiling to himself because the Archdiocese of Santa Fe and this whole area, New Mexico, Arizona, this goes way back before Boston was established, Philadelphia was established, New York was established. Mm -hmm. The friars were here, and of course the Jesuits and the Dominicans were also here too. Right. So we have to give credit to the That's other orders. True. But for me, it was the faith of that uh, of that <coughs> archetypal, multi generational uh, Hispanic, uh, you know, Catholic that uh, really inspired me. Anyhow, I don't want to take too much time away from your talk. You gave you're giving a wonderful talk as we speak um, at Santa Maria de la Paz. I I knew that from your previous talk, and I was happy to be there. Uh, I want to thank Tom Burton for reminding me that you were going to be there, and I'm glad I got to come. Uh, tell us a bit about the importance of, of, of spirituality relationships and communication and how important that is, whether you're religious or not religious, and, and how important it is in our relationships. Well, the thrust that I'm taking um, is to situate relationships in building blocks. So uh, yesterday, the topic dealt with faith and trust and confidence is the basic building block of all relationships. Uh, two people cannot move forward in any kind of a meaningful relationship, especially the domestic relationships of family and marriage and friendship, with, if they don't trust each other and they don't have faith in each other, they don't have confidence in each other. So moving from that angle, trying to explore what faith means in our human relationships by looking at that through the relationship, the primordial relationship of our lives, which is the relationship we have with, with the God who created us, and learning from that primary relationship with God how to build better relationships with each other. How do we cope uh, with the stresses and the pressures that life has put before us if we don't have that uh, connection with some higher power uh, and we don't have that connection with each other that keeps us moving in the face of struggles and problems and conflicts. If left to our own devices, uh, we really and truly would be a lost group of people. It's that, that faith in God and trust in each other that keeps us resolving rather than disintegrating uh, the relationships. Yesterday I finished uh, the, the little reflection by indicating that unfortunately there are practical atheisms that if we allow them to get a hold on our minds and our hearts and our interaction with each other, they can empty us of our capacity to trust. And I indicated uh, that those three uh, practical atheisms were the atheism of the eye. Uh, and by that I meant that as some of us grow older, unfortunately, we don't become wiser, uh, we don't become more introspective, reflective. Some of us become fascinated by what's wrong and what's dark. And our first reaction to everything is a negative reaction. When we take that and put it into the context of relationships, we are all imperfect people. But if we consistently zero in on what's wrong with each other, rather than seeing the graced dimension of our lives and our relationships, th these relationships can be emptied of confidence. If all I ever see in you is your brokenness and your fragmentation and your splinteredness, what does that do for us? It doesn't do anything. So uh, that atheism of the eye, we, we have to be aware of that because we live in a cynical, uh, sarcastic, jaded culture and that can very easily infiltrate into um, uh, even the best of us. It can infiltrate into our lives and give us that cynical, jaded, sarcastic attitude, that negative attitude toward life. Uh, the second uh, atheism uh, was of an underdeveloped imagination. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced when we read in Genesis uh, that we're made in the image and likeness of God, 
I said jokingly, that doesn't mean that God has brown hair and blue <laughs> eyes and an Irish last name, <laughs> although I know he'd love to have those qualities. He, he has shared with us his own imagination, and that has got to be fertilized. It has got to be de developed. It has got to be ap applied. Um, I, I often think, and I know you've seen this, uh, you go to a restaurant in the evening, you're enjoying the time that, we're, that you have with your friends and family, and you look across th the restaurant, and here is an older married couple. Uh, they sit there for the entire evening, and not a word passes between them. Um, I, I'm not judging them, but I would like to say I don't think that that's the silence of love. I think that, that Thoreau... Uh, would say that what you're looking at is a manifestation of quiet desperation. They are so bored with each other, they're so tired with each other that they go to a restaurant uh, even though they don't say a word because at least they can have a conversation with the kid that's waiting on them. And you look at that and you realize what happened to that marriage. It, it began with energy, it began with passion, mm -hmm. it began with fire and it began with love. And here they are. I think it's an indication of an underdeveloped imagination. They have not continued to bring life. Teresa of Avila mm -hmm. says that relationships are like a garden and water needs to be brought to the garden so that the flowers and the vegetables can grow. And the water of rich relationships is the water of imagination. The third atheism, which is the worst of the three because it's the reason for the other two, um, is what I call the atheism of distraction. That we become so overextended and so busy and so involved that there's never any time uh, for quiet, for silence, for solitude, and we end up becoming hollow and shallow, if not even stupid people. And relationships today demand depth. They cannot survive if, if there's not um, some degree of, of profundity, mm -hmm. uh, to use a word, some degree of depth. So the distraction can destroy it. I mean, when I'm so distracted, I won't take the time to see the goodness that's in you, so all I see is what's wrong with you. If I'm so busy, all I'll um, do is try to attend to the business of my life, and I won't take time. Uh, to go to, to the museums. I mean, Santa Fe, I love this part of the country. I came here as a student to St. John's, and I came here even long before that. Uh, this is where I come to recalibrate my own compass. This is a, an area given to a mystical approach, a kind of transcendental atmosphere. It's atmospherically transcendental in Santa Fe. And given that, we, that you live in that kind of an environment, it would be tragic to become so busy that we don't stop and, and let depth happen in our life so that we can come to each other in our relationships from that deeper wellspring of life. Um, of course, that depth is fed by prayer it is fed by uh, reading the scriptures. It is uh, fed by a strong faith community and regular attendance at mass and the celebration of the church's sacraments. All of these are sources of life. So uh, I believe that uh, relationships are some of the greatest blessings and gifts that God has given to us, but they need to be cultivated and developed in the face of all that I've just said. Yeah, well, I, I would validate everything that you said in my own experience. It's one of the reasons I go to daily Mass as often as I can to receive the sacraments because it puts me in that place. Right. And I go to the Sacrament of Reconciliation and on a regular basis too because if anything getting in the way, I can dump it there, you know, right. in that, this little box, this, this psychic or spiritual toxic waste dump that I can come in and deposit my own toxicity that I may have picked up from others or I've participated in that is, that's taken away from that. Right. That and certainly that sacrament, that sacrament of reconciliation yeah. becomes enormously important in the journey of relationships because your, your image is interesting, a toxic waste dump. 
um, a good way of putting it, but there's always another dimension too, and that is that we are relieved of our sins by the absolution of the Lord through the ministry of the church and the priest. But we come out of that experience with the grace to make a change, mm -hmm. to make a change in our own lives, the spirit of ongoing conversion, and also that we would take that grace of conversion into the relationships that are present in our life, whether that's in the, the world or in, in which we live, or the small worlds, what they say in Spanish, el mundo pequeño, the tiny world mm -hmm. in which we live within our own families and relationships. Mm -hmm. The sacrament is an extremely important experience of renewal and change. Mm -hmm. You spoke also of an interesting uh, concept of the walking depression, not clinically depressed, but, right. um, and one of the reasons I go to the sacrament of reconciliation because I, I find that life's pressures over a period of time can just make you depressed. Or if you're around people who, as you mentioned, are so unhappy that they've, they're carrying around so much guilt or, their, or animosity towards people and they, they haven't bothered to look to the Lord for uh, a way out. Right. You know what I mean? And take a chance on that for whatever, some cultural imperative they picked up somewhere that, you know, Christianity or organized religion, for that matter, has no value to them and, and they know better, and yet they're still suffering. Well, I believe that this walking depression, which you're right, is not clinical depression. It's a mild, low form of depression. I believe it's tied in the lives of many people to a simple failure to communicate. Mm. We cannot, we cannot keep, keep stuffing down, down, down into the box of our psyche the struggles, the issues, the conflicts, the problems that we have, expecting them to resolve themselves uh, or expecting them to somehow disappear. Um, it is very important for people in marriages and in families, in any gathering of, of sincere people to talk, to reflect, to share so that we get off of our high horses, our arrogant high horses, and learn how to compromise. And certainly um, prayer is a very important dimension of this because I take my conflicts and I take my struggles into the presence of the Lord in prayer. I, I learn in that encounter with God how to come back out and share with others reconciliation. And that God himself reconciles me uh, to myself and to my world, and then I, um, the implication is that, that we're going to do what we are going to share what we ourselves have received. Yeah. And if the experience of confession is an experience of reconciliation, then why not take that reconciliation out into an altogether fragmented and broken world? Uh, I've just come back from eight weeks in Europe uh, for the last couple of years, I've been doing work with the Army in various bases in Germany, and uh, there is so much fragmentation and so much splinteredness in, in families within the military. These are unbelievably generous people who make unbelievable sacrifices of their own lives so that the rest of us can enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. But um, it's very difficult. Uh, deployment has taken these families uh, away from each other. Uh, spouses have been left beho behind trying to, to struggle and to cope, uh, raising kids, maintaining some semblance of, of family life. And uh, all that we can do in the sacramental life of the church, in our own prayer life, in the richness of our, of our Catholic faith community, to support and to uh, encourage and to nourish these relationships we need to do this, and we are already doing it, by the way. Mm -hmm. We're not um, way out on left field. This, the Archdiocese of Santa Fe, um, because of strong leadership, has really arrived at a, a very blessed state of existence. It doesn't mean that everything is perfect, understandably so, but I believe that the Archdiocese is in a very good place there is a sense of church, there is a sense of belonging, there is an appreciation of, of Catholic community life in the Archdiocese. And it's because of the hard work of lay people, the priests, the deacons, and, and the Archbishop himself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I consider myself a direct beneficiary yeah. to their efforts. Speak a minute to the people who don't come to church, who don't have any developed faith, who don't see uh, Christianity even as a valuable 
uh, tool for their existence and for their life to give them hope and, uh, and healing. Uh, what advice would you have for them? Well, I believe um, that there is a transcendental dimension to the human person. Um, and many people don't pay much attention to that, and they really ought to. In those quiet moments, late at night, when the family is asleep and we can't get to sleep and we go down into uh, the quiet of the kitchen and maybe uh, make a, a little cup of coffee or, or whatever for ourselves and we sit in the silence of that kitchen, there is there's something that rises out of us that makes us aware that, this, that we are not alone, uh, that we are um, in some strange way interconnected to the universe, um, and that that transcendental quality is placed within us as a kind of holy longing for God. Uh, it needs to be attended to. It needs to be nourished and it needs to be fertilized by periods of quiet reflection. Uh, these folks who could not at this point in time possibly imagine themselves uh, joining a faith community of Catholics, Lutherans, uh, whatever denomination, I understand that. I understand that it takes people time to come to appreciate the importance of organized religion and regular religious practice. I understand that. But I hope to God that in not embracing organized religion at this point, they don't, they don't fail, that, that they cultivate and nourish that holy longing that has been placed within them by God. And in cultivating that, that becomes an enlarged reality. It, it puts them into, into touch with maybe other dimensions of, of faith and transcendence and often is the very vehicle that brings them into a, a community of believing people in some way, shape, or form. What, what is my advice? Please consider the importance of a faith community. But if that is an impossible situation because you have been turned off by somebody, angered by something, or you have created maybe some situation in your marriage or whatever that has for the moment disenfranchised you from the church. Whatever you do, don't close all the doors of the holy longing that is within you, that innate grace of searching and seeking for a larger reality than just ourselves. That's one of the reasons, by the way. I, I have a background in literature as well as theology. And I think one of the finest novels that's ever been written was written by Evelyn Waugh, Bride's Head Revisited, because it is the story of a whole family who individually, one by one, lost their way. And one by one, because of the relentless pursuit of grace and the holy longing that's buried within us, waiting to be recognized, dormantly lying there, each one of them came home. So uh, I would say don't eliminate organized religion belonging to a faith community, but most importantly, attend to that inner spirit of God that is within you. I think that's good advice. Uh, just in the few minutes we have left remaining, um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Tell us about uh, your, your group of Franciscans or people who might be considering where they, where they could go to go on retreat or how, how a retreat actually affects people. Why is it so beneficial? It seems like it is to me. Very good question. I believe that um, time away, uh, the Lord himself in the scriptures, as you know, pulled away and uh, invited the apostles uh, to come away with him also. Why? Because uh, it is this attending to the, to the inner life that is so important. How can people who are married, people in the business community, how can, how can uh, that ranchers in Roy, New Mexico, in Mosquero, in Boyeros, how can they do what they do um, out there with continual presence and continual attentiveness if they don't nurture and nourish their interior lives? So the purpose of a retreat, whether it's a parish mission which is what we're doing at Santa Maria de la Paz, or uh, uh, a much more um, uh, individualized retreat for married couples, for single people, for priests, for nuns, whatever. For, believe it or not, for the media. 
it is possible that the media needs redemption. Um. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here, Father. Um, Turn the cameras off. <laughs> yes. You're going to hear my confession <laughs> here on the spot. Thank it you. is possible that the, that the media needs to, re to reconsider and move away from the hype and so forth that, unfortunately, you are often, I'm sure, placed within uh, to, to reconsider what's important so that we're not always caught up, caught up, caught up in everything to the neglect of that interiority, which is the thing that sustains us in the end. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of a mission, giving ourselves time, allowing the Lord access to us uh, so that we can grow and deepen, and our whole lives. What's, what's the effect? Some people have had profound religious conversions. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't claim any of that for myself. I'm only one part of the whole process, but I do believe that the Lord rises to the occasion and touches people in a very profound way in these kinds of religious moments. I totally agree. It's happened in my experience. Uh, well, listen, I want to thank you, Father, uh, for coming in. I know you're right in the middle of giving a parish mission, and it was very generous of you to do that for, for those folks who weren't able to be there. It was a terrific experience, and I plan to go back as well. Uh, but I want to encourage you, uh, if you haven't been on retreat, uh, to seriously consider going on retreat. Take some time away. Take some time for your spiritual life. Uh, go alone if you can't get members of your family to go with you or your friends. You won't regret it. You'll really benefit from that time away. Also, watch the credits and see uh, Father Gallagher's address and, and phone number will be there. Uh, ask him to come and to come to your parish or come to your church and uh, give a parish mission or a, a some type of retreat. I think you'll really enjoy that. Or I'm sure he could refer you to other people to have that opportunity to give some time to your spiritual life. So I want to thank him for, for coming in. And I know everybody that has been there is really thankful for your coming back Pleasure as well. Pleasure is mine. Thank so, you. So super. Okay. So we want to encourage you in your spiritual life. We hope that you've enjoyed this type of programming. We'd like to hear from you if you have. Uh, please watch the credits too. We want to thank the people that helped this, uh, make this possible here at Santa Fe Community College Television, uh, Doreen Ortiz, our director, and Tom Burton, our camera people, and the people who have supported us behind the scenes, Kevin Dalton, Santa Fe Baking Company, Seisai Restaurant here in Santa Fe, and others. We welcome your support. We welcome your contributions to help this ministry go forward. So on behalf of everybody here at Spirituality TV, this is Bill O'Donnell wishing you well, and stay tuned at this time next week for another program on spirituality. Thank you.